So, and welcome to another exciting edition of Tales for Wales, the pod that never, ever, ever fails to find their notes that they wrote down earlier for a good intro. <laughs> Give me a second. Uh, that never fails to fill your noggin with a bit of history, a few laughs, and a nice big dollop of Wales mixed in. Ugh. Dollop. It's a good <laughs> word. Time to write that down as well. Yeah, good word in the heat yeah. as well. Oh, um, it's, yeah, for the audience, you'll know we are experiencing weather whales should never have experienced. No, we're not built for this shit. <laughs> we are not dealing with it well. <laughs> give us rain, give us yeah. fog, give us mist, yeah. we're fine, but give us the yes. heat and by God. Oh, let me tell you the fact. So just for better audio, you might can tell I bought a better headset recording thing for season three. And I've, uh, just to make sure it's been better, I've turned off the fucking air, the uh, fan. So... This is all for the pure, all for audio, just for the our pursuit of good audio, and we're going to suffer. You've refused the the privilege of cold air for the yeah. sake of the pod. <laughs> I like it. That's a sacrifice. The uh, microphone. I got a new microphone, and it's attached to my mouth. Oh, like to my face. So if I move, it follows me. But we just found out it hinders the drinking process. You got to like yeah. scoop your gob round to the right to let it pour in. As I'll show the you things now. Things we do for you, fucking listeners. I swear oh. to God. Oh, we want to be able to hear you properly. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, we want perfect audio. This is the first time in about six episodes I've not had a cold or had hay fever, and I feel fucking mm. electric. You, on the other hand, have just come back. I from feel a, bad. <laughs> just come back from a rock festival, <laughs> and you're all. Uh, oh, I was been. Yeah, I've been rocking on. Rock on, on man. <laughs> rock on, it's, dude. It's, <laughs> cowabunga, man. Cowabunga, buddy. <laughs> The um the thing is, it's more of a cumulative effect because I was on my honeymoon for ten days, all inclusive. So I like battered my body in terms of boozing. Yeah, not I had, like, a brief boozing. window. Not yeah, <laughs> just boozing a little bit, and a sprinkle of shagging, but mainly boozing. <laughs> what was and, his um, name? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> And I then, am uh, <laughs> dry. I'm so buzzing, man. I'm not... so keen. I'm, <laughs> I'll try and match your level at some point. I really will. Yeah. But um, so we went. Yeah, I tend to booze in there. Then I had like a brief window where I was like back and work for like two days. And I went to download, and that was like just drinking every day, all day. And it's just my body's gone. Are you fucking serious? <laughs> and you know me, I love, I love, as much as the next little booze hound, the hair of the dog. But I came back. I, I had a full day to myself to recover. And I, I wasn't even tempted to crack a beer for the, to take the edge off. Whoa. I was like, I can't physically face one. So wow. it was a big one for me, a big turning point. In my, I had a long look in the mirror, yeah. and then I waited till Wednesday, and then I just had another beer. So well, I have I didn't I had a healthy weekend. I'm on a health kick. I've been gymming it quite a bit. Um, like I've been doing ten thousand steps a day. Fuck me, that's a lot of steps. Like when we me and me used, well, me and you used to go to the gym together. And we used to walk from one side of Cardiff to the other. We'd walk three, like uh, nearly three miles just to get to the fucking gym. And then we'd get to the gym and then go to work. Since COVID, <laughs> I was doing like a oh, thousand mate. steps a day. The pandemic, it made us soft, didn't it? It took away all <laughs> our fucking us. muscle mass. <laughs> yeah, we so, us down. I'm now trying to get like my 10K in, so I'm always fucking walking around. And it's so hot and bothered. Um, but oh, I didn't I drink much on the weekend. I was eating quite healthy. My girlfriend's now gone away for the week, and I booked tomorrow off work. So for the last like four, three That's days, no I've wonder been you're so fucking perko, <laughs> isn't it? Full I'm of getting, nutrients. I am getting rest tonight. I, I keep, <laughs> yeah. I keep like messaging you all week, saying, like, "Come so early, so early." I had my tea today yeah. at half three, so I don't have to stop and have dinner. Yeah. 
for the for the listeners he said i had my tea early at uh, half three i was like wow pre-tea and then I, he sent me a picture of what it was like do you ever go to like don't, a, don't a reveal my like secrets the, they have they have a tray bake sort of thing <laughs> wow <laughs> i won't go into detail but it was um it was the uh <laughs> a tea for a man who doesn't have much time on his hands and wants to really wolf it down quick can i can i just read verbatim what was said i sent you a photo of my dinner and it was uh, mm. jalapenos, cheese, um, chips, and um, four chicken dippers. And then four you lonely went, dips. Yeah. <laughs> you said, all in one tray. And I went, I told Emma I was going to be healthy, so you must keep your rat lips of yours shut. And you said verbatim, your secret is safe with me, pod bros honour. And within a Hang minute, on. in a minute. Surely, you... Emma doesn't listen to the pod, does she? She has her spies. She has oh, her she way. <laughs> They're always watching and listening. The spies are ever present. <laughs> <laughs> They're always watching and listening. They'll be As I say, I could say anything on this pod, and I know we'd never get back to Amy. She <laughs> she never listen. <laughs> I did say, I did say, like, I'm I'm usually the only time I mention Emma on here is to say how much like how how much we love our partners. But I always make mm. out to him that I go on the pod and I start telling everyone how much she's horrible to me and how much she beats Slagging me. Her stuff. Off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but really, we <laughs> yeah. we love our dolls, don't we? Our old, old better our old darlings. <laughs> yeah, better ass. I am yeah. so buzzing for today. I cannot explain it. I can tell. I, it's still <laughs> wrong. It's infectious. I just need a little bit of a higher dose, all right? Hey, ready? <laughs> it'll take me a little bit longer for it to feed you my system. Oh, my can is freezing. I bought them last night as well to get them pure froze. You, you can't oh. see it because we've we've um oh you do love that sound you can't yeah. see it because we've turned our cameras off but uh, I am literally rubbing my cold can against my forehead <laughs> at the moment to try and fucking cool my grumpy little forehead that on forehead my forehead <laughs> that on my forehead oh, um, oh, anyway well, I I didn't even finish my my intro there did I but yeah, it doesn't really well. matter we're um what, what, have you been up to anything mate we'll, we'll get it on to that we've already done a little well, bit of riff but that's I, just. I, I went it. out. I went out for like, like I said, I haven't been drinking, but I did have a, a few casual beers last night with some mates at the pub, and um, we mm. were reminded of when we went. To, I think we've we've I was, we've actually discussed this holiday on the pod before. It was when we went to Lorette de Mar, and it was the mm. worst holiday of our life. It was fucking abysmal, but we ended up mm. having one like some funny nights in like a. If you come from Cardiff, you'll know the nightclub Metros, aka Sweatros. Yeah. It's like a little mosh pit underground. It's fucking grim, but really fun. It's one of my favorite. It used to be one of my favorite places to go, um, but it's it horrible. It's been old haunt. Yeah, um, there was a similar one in in Lorette de Mar in Spain um, called Froggies. Froggy, like no, the Froggies. Frog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we were so drunk in there. Jack was so drunk in there, and they used to have was, this like <laughs> yeah. was, they had this ceramic frog that was their mascot above the bar. And Jack oh, was like, yeah, yeah. "Oh, can I have it? Can I have it?" And they're like, "No, no, 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 no. That's that's our mascot. We like, please don't touch it." I just want it for a picture. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I just want it. It's good for your socials. Just put it on socials. Yeah. And, um, and I remember they... going like, "I will treat it with the utmost care, my liege. I swear." <laughs> you have my word as a Welshman. I <laughs> shall not. My, my word, word as a Welshman of the Welsh <laughs> country, and my word is my bond. So. <laughs> and and you, they gave you this ceramic frog. And you put it on your head, and within a second, it fell and smashed on the floor. <laughs> Into absolute smithereens on the floor. And it was, was um, so drunk, like, I got the pick, though. Yeah, you got the Craig pick. Got, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Craig got my pick, smashed into smithereens, and when they were, like, kicking off, I was like, oh, it's just a fucking frog, like. You, just <laughs> you, you were like, what did you expect? I'm smashed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is on you guys, not me. Uh, and then... <laughs> yeah. um, and then we, we were like, they let us stay in there despite us smashing their, like, uh, their, uh, uh, what, idol. The idol of their god. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the ba- you were really smashed. And then the bouncer came up to you like an hour later to take you out. And as he came up to you, your legs just <laughs> failed. And they, you remember I, you I, flapped I, to the floor? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not lying, right? I've never drunk so much before in my life that my legs just would not work. It wasn't like a like all the boys thought I was doing like a play in possum. Like you know, this will get me out of it if I just pretend I don't have use of my legs. But I didn't. I really was like I can't get up. Like whatever. I remember crawling and trying to. I tried to grab a stool, stool like stool as like stool thing, and it you. just just fell on me. <laughs> it was the most me, pathetic me, sight. The uh, Craig and the bouncer. 
and we and Craig picked you up and the bouncer put the stool under your ass to sit you on there and then he was like mm. oh, right fine <laughs> I guess you can stay and then he just stayed sat on the stool for a while and then later on he fell again and the bouncer looked at me and Craig to help and me and Craig were like he's your problem now my lord yeah. <laughs> he just turned up Malgrat de Mar has him now yeah <laughs> If the if he lives, he lives. Except for the gods yeah. inside. <laughs> yeah, we can do no more for him. He really couldn't <laughs> at that point. I was fucking bad. Yeah, yeah. No, I just thought. Um, yeah, we were discussing it last night, and I thought I'd mention. I'd, I'd, I'd do a follow-up. Good story that one. Yeah, old yeah, froggies. Old froggies. We did love it. We love going anywhere in the world we go. We find the shittest bar and we make it our own for like the full week. Yeah. We make it work, don't we? I know it's a bit like um, ripping off was always sunny, but we absolutely love dive bars, don't we? Oh, we really do. Like, um, uh, Amy's not a bit the biggest fan of it, but when we go on holiday, I love going to find, um, uh, like if they've got a British bar somewhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they're always the pubs. biggest shitholes. Yeah, and they've always got like, um, there's only one place I went actually where there was one called the Celtic Bar, which I quite enjoyed. It wasn't that great though. It just had like, um, <laughs> all the it just had a Welsh flag, an Irish flag, and a Scottish flag like hung up <laughs> on a wall somewhere. It was like Celtic oh. Bar done, but most of them have like. Uh, it's like it's a British pub, pub British, and all they have things like, like I don't know if they think this is what pubs are like in Britain, but then it's like crossbows on the walls and just like portraits of Henry VIII and stuff <laughs> yeah. like that. It's just yeah, like, of course, yeah, every pub like, I go to, we have some hounds and uh, some Shakespeare read to me as I walk in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but there's always normally cheap and cheerful is what I like yeah. about them. Well, not really cheerful. It's cheap and no, it's, it's even open. fucking miserable. Yeah. <laughs> just don't <laughs> like it. Um, also, if you don't listen to the full episode, some people like might, you know, like sometimes I do the podcast, I listen to as much as I can, and then I fuck it off. And um, we've started reading out the reviews at the end of the podcast, and I was thinking maybe should we do it at the start or should we do it as a teaser, but tell them that we'll, well, we can let the the people who don't listen to the very end know that we're reading out the funny reviews we're getting. Oh, we could do, yeah. I mean, we could just uh, shift it to the front, couldn't we? Oh, pff, classic us, still in the bloody Qatar history. Top charts, aren't we? I was going to say that. Seventy-one. On that, because um, we have a friend. We we know someone who's a expat out there, and he shared it with his friends. So there's a bunch of uh, expats in Qatar who are now into this. So it looks like we got loads of Qatarians, but really it's just a bunch of the lads who are over there. So big shout Uh, out to Big Rod Lewis, Rod Davis. Cheers, Big Rod. Thank you, baby. (laughs) I'll. uh... Should we? We don't want to read out the nasty one, do we? We've already What's done that a few times, one? I think. You know the the jibber jabber. Hit it again because it's quite funny, and I I have I don't. Okay, I'll, I'll give you the full one. This is from Olivia two hundred. Two hundredth of her name. Yeah, two hundredth of her name, and she says it is hard to get through this. I understand a little conversation <laughs> between the presenters, but this is way over the top. I am interested in the subject matter, but not all the jibber jabber. Oh. Fucking hell. <laughs> Tell you what, Olivia, next time you get a prompt to give someone a fucking review, don't rip their entrails out, okay? <laughs> Dangle it in front of them and say, this is dog shit, you are made of dog shit. It's not We, nice. we have families, Olivia. We have I'm families. Fucking, I have, How can I look I'm like feeling. Beyonce in the eye? Knowing that old Olivia's ripped the fur. That, to be fair, that's, the rest of them are fun. So last week's when we read out one by some dude or lady. <laughs> lady, some lady, my liege, um, who left a really nice, funny one. Um, and I think we're going to start doing that more often. I think we're going to try and go go through all our reviews and read them out and give a shout out to those who've done one. Um, I got so, uh, there's another one here. It's a uh, oh, should I re- read out another one? No, no, let's do one, one an episode. Yeah, this is, one this an episode. Yeah. We, this is going to be quite a long episode. Let's mm. just do one a week, and then because the episodes run quite long, so it'll just be a little <laughs> little community thing that we do at the start. But you yeah, said a minute ago... Pat on the back, isn't it, while yeah. we're starting? We're no, not. we're giving our, our community a voice. We're, we're letting them know mm. that we, we are... That's you know, true. This, this, we, we are a tribe. And talking of tribes, this week's episode's all about a funny little tribe called the Celts. Ah, Celtic whales, yes. Yeah. And they're not a tribe, the tribes they're a that made us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the tribes that made us. Very good. Yeah, this might be a bit of a long one, so you know, settle in for the long haul. I'm gonna try. I have cut corners as best I could, um, in terms of not in terms of facts, but like when it goes into details that you kind of don't need. I've sort of skipped yeah. over them to try. Yeah, we don't want boring co- shit. Yeah, I just want to be cohesive, you know, nice yeah. and um, to the point. So, you want to talk about Celtic whales 
and sort of like the culture that defined them, uh, what was a Celt, uh, what Celts did, uh, what they were known for, etc. And I'm going to touch a little bit on the kind of like um, how the Roman invasion affected Celts in Wales and how that sort of set the landscape for the country for the future. As I said, I'm going to try and make it as brisk as possible, not go into too many details. And can um, I say here that next week's episode is going to be around one specific Celtic leader, and I'll be doing that episode. Um, yes. And look behind the, the podcaster's cloth, but we're doing that episode yes, tonight as well. Yes, curtain. Yeah, but um, you'll be you'll be doing the background, and I'll be doing specific on a specific Yeah, so he, he'll, he'll, I'll flag him when he gets yeah. a mention, but he's yes, um, cool. uh, he gets a very say, brisk. Yeah, because yeah. he's, he's, he's a, a brisk figure. briefing with me, and then you get the you'll get the uh, the full whack then with Franco Perfect. in the next episode. So before I get into it, um, I just want to give a little bit of background and sort of set the landscape so the listeners will hopefully have a better idea of what I'm talking about. So firstly, I'll just out- outline uh, what we're talking about when we use the term Celt or Celtic. Celts or Celtic people um, are a group that are today primarily defined by the use of Celtic language. So of around 16 different Celtic languages that once existed, only six remain today. Uh, we've got Cymraeg, uh, Gaelgia, Gaelic, Gilk, Kennewek, and Bresonic, or Welsh, Irish slash Gaelic, Scottish slash Gaelic, Manx, Cornish, and Breton, effectively. Uh, any speakers of those languages, by the way, I did try my best to find the right pronunciations, but if I fucked it up, you know, just fucking grow up and get over it, because I'm trying my best. Yeah. Uh, But while the Celts today are only found in Wales, Ireland, Scotland, the Isle of Man, Cornwall and Brittany, they once live across a huge territory encompassing present-day France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and parts of Switzerland, Germany and even northern Italy. It covered an area of around uh, 191,000 square miles actually, so it was the Celtic sort of nation, if you like, way, way, way back when, was quite a large one. So that classes Mediterranean, wouldn't it? the parts of uh, yeah so you got like um they weren't called mediterranean at the time obviously but there there was a huge variation in kind of what a celt would look like depending on where in yeah in the celtic nation you came from because obviously if you're right up north and out south you look you look quite a bit different um and you'd have different variations of um what's called proto celt as well as a language uh but anyway that's like way way back i'm talking before they even came to britain that is yeah um so tribes broke away from this territory, and although it's quite debated, um, it's apparently around 600 BC is when the first Celts landed on the shores of Britain, and then Ireland not too long after that. And what I think is quite interesting as well is I was trying to look of, uh, at who was living the British Isles before the Celts. I was just going to ask so that often, question. Uh, yeah, because be you know, so often yeah. we talk about these things, and it's like you attribute a group of people to an area only to find that they actually were just another group that came there and yeah, either merged yeah. or displaced the original. Like Anglo-Saxons. But the on- yeah, exactly, yeah. But the only people that lived in Britain before the Celts were actually Neanderthals, and they were extinct by this point. No way. So it generally was a free bit of land that they were free to develop and grow on. So <laughs> absolute easy take-ins. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, I thought that was so interesting that there yeah. th- wasn't a previous, you know, the, the Celts, yeah. not counting prehistoric people. Uh, they're and literally I don't the count you know, them. original thing. Scum and of I the don't. <laughs> yeah, Neanderthals <laughs> are literally not people in my eyes. So, <laughs> call, call me a fascist. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, from that initial landing, the Celts spread all over the British Isles, uh, with all of the many tribes known collectively as Britons or Britonic Celts, which separated them from what would be like Indo-European Celts. Um, Can I ask a question? Um, mm-hmm. Is that different to Brisson, like B R Y T H O N, I K? No, it, no, br- yeah, B B R. What is it? B R Y T H O N O N I C, isn't it? Brythonic, yeah, or Britonic, yeah. The Britonic Those Celts things. are Celts that come from the British Isles. Okay, so. cool. Because I, I was reading about the same stuff, and you know, like people who read Harry Potter when they were trying to figure out how to say Hermione. Because you never hear it out mm. loud. I, I didn't know if you me own. Yeah. yeah. So so when I was reading about Britons, that's Britons. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, and then it got the sort of spelling is different when the Romans came into that then because it was then B R I T O N. Okay. Uh, and then Britannia and things like that. So, but yeah, yeah Britonic, Britannia. When you we hear know that, that baby, love it. Rule Britannia, we know that one well. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, Britonic or well, Britonic rather is yeah, just Britonic Celts were the ones that came from the uh, Brit, uh, British Isles then. So uh, yeah, like I said, today I'm going to be focusing on the Britons uh, that lived in Wales specifically and talk a bit about their culture, beliefs. Going to go through what happened when the big Balshi Romans came knocking and how that was sort of shaped Wales for the future. I'll start by talking about Celtic culture and touch on their beliefs and their religious practices a little bit, just to give you a flavour of the sort of peoples they were. And this is obviously very broad strokes, as different tribes and sub-tribes would have slight variations on traditions and, and whatnot. But something that links all Celts from different eras and locations is the presence of what's called Latin culture. So Latin is kind of complicated, but in a, in a broad sense. Celts never ever wrote anything down like the Greeks or the Romans did. But they did always put certain signs and symbols of their culture into their crafts, specifically um, metalwork, not limited to metalwork, but they mainly use metalwork. So all across Celtic culture, archaeologists have found metalwork that depicts gods and symbols that all resemble each other in some fashion, given the Celts are kind of connected artistry. So things like axe and spearheads, swords, shields, chariot adornments, sculptures, pots, jewellery and tools would all have these elaborate abstract designs with twisted and curved lines. A common symbol that shows up is something called a triskel, which is like a, a triple spiral. You, you've probably seen it before somewhere, If for you and the listeners even. If you just Google a triskel, you'll you'll recognise the symbol Let me in, in some it. fashion. How do you spell it? Yeah. Tris triskel, T-R-I-S-K-E-L-E. Oh, wow, it's so you'll far. Know it. It's kind of... Oh it's yeah. Kind of like yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. You can it's probably see it's, it's on somewhere. Um, yeah, it's on a flag, and it? it's on one of the Celtic flags. I think it's yeah, on, like, that's right. It's it's used often in like if you yeah. if you're trying to search for something even vaguely yeah. Celtic, it's usually a symbol that's used yeah. there. So that is something that pops up a lot, no matter what sort of Celtic region you find these discoveries in. Triskels turn up a lot, as well as like um, depictions of heads. Uh, heads were very important to Celts spiritually. That's where they thought um, the soul was kept. Um, oh, and idiots. yeah, just like look, is it bloody idiots? There's no such thing. We all know um, it's always kept in the yeah. ass. It's in the bum. You know, it's in the bum. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, as you can probably deduce uh, by these um, this description of this metalwork, the Celts were excellent craftsmen and could produce very high quality jewelry, weapons, and armor, as well as hardy tools. The skill led to a lot of trade between Celtic nations and whatever territories bordered them, fostering economic relationships between all sorts of peoples, including even the Romans and the Greeks. Uh, as a side note as well, uh, did you know the Celts invented chainmail? Because I oh, didn't nice. know this. Oh, yeah, I... so before, you sort of think of a Celt as just um, Naked. Uh, fighting with the cocks out, didn't you? And, yeah. and some of them did do that, to be fair. But um, a lot of them uh, had some pretty high-grade armour for the time period. Apparently, it's, yeah, the Romans reported when they first sort of engaged the Celts. Um, they noticed they were in this chainmail armour and they didn't uh, they didn't have that at the time. So is that so Celts not I, from Britain? Uh, it's a bit of both. It's, it's Celts in general, I guess. But they would have had it in Britain as well at the time. Because just like it's uh, like an Iron Age thing that they concocted or invented, whatever the word Cause, is. Cause, yeah, I, I always just picture that with like, the Normans and, and those who were much more heavily armoured when they came over. Yeah, but you, you, know, you could face, um, in theory, a Celt that was like draped in chain mail, like proper high quality grade armour and shields and stuff like that. And it's, I know it's a bit different from the sort of thing that's depicted in, maybe not popular media, but you know, media when you look it yeah. up. Well, also, yeah, it, the, one I cover, the one I cover, they, they, mm. are, they kind of quote that they don't have any armour. Um, yeah, the there's plenty of, um, um, you know, even uh, plenty of Celt Celtic tribes that didn't fight with it, and they were like an aggressive. They, it was more like a show of uh, confidence, wasn't it? Like, yeah. hey, look at my, look at my fucking big old cack. And <laughs> yeah, look, look at my targe. Yeah. Look at my targe. Oh yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to do it. No, boys, just wear the chainmail. Like, <laughs> come on. Why is it only around your dick? <laughs> no reason. No yeah. Reason. Oh, look, just start asking questions. Let's get the fight on with. <laughs> But yeah, so yeah, little tidbit, and I uh, it was <laughs> impressed with that pick. anyway. Certainly interested, <laughs> a little dick pick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this was. Oh, yeah, so where can I just now? say, as as an aside, mm. I, I decided for now I'm not gonna I'm gonna put my phone far away. So I hope you've been mm -hmm. you might have told I'm more engaged. 
Oh, good. Good, good. Because I think in, um, in previous ones, I have the, the tendency to, like, my phone will buzz and I'll look at it. And I just think it's... In previous ones, I've been boring as fuck. And no, no. No, I think I realised on the last time when I, was re- <laughs> when I was editing the pod, I was like, oh, I should have been paying more attention because it was generally really interesting. But I was, like, doing a bit of work and stuff in the background, which I don't... Which isn't fair, so... No, you gotta you gotta put the pod over everything now, mate. It's high yeah, priority, mate. Yeah. You know? And it makes it more so fun what... conversation. Exactly, exactly. A bit of back and forth, a bit of pitter yeah. patter. Um, so, like I said, Celts were excellent craftsmen, uh, and they used their crafts to in trade, weapons, uh, jewelry, all sorts of things. And this was no different in Wales. There's a lot of trade, especially um, from the south of Wales, where they sold and bought goods consistently. Um, to and from uh, a tribe of Celts called the Veneti. The Veneti were um, a tribe from northern Brittany and they were a seafaring sub-tribe of the Bretons that lived there. They sort of specialised in the seafaring trade and warfare and things like that. They were like a naval based, uh, based Celtic tribe. And through them, Wales had access to a much larger European market um, so, you know, turn away any Brexiteers because it seems like the Celts were Remainers, <laughs> all right? Well, the, um, that's the other thing I didn't realise, that they weren't, like, isolated. They were, like, yeah. they had access. They were way more, um, yeah, part of the, they, they weren't a part of the free market. They were really into They're the Part of the single market. European market, okay? They, <laughs> yeah. they believed in, yeah. in the free movement, okay? <laughs> but they, <laughs> that that's literally was my next point, is, like, I always thought, like, oh, they were just in Britain and they maybe traded a bit with each other, but they yeah. really did have like connections to um like the mediterranean yeah, Rome and block. greece through these veneti like they, they that was their sort of tra- uh, trade lane um but uh, and you'll like this as well that one of their biggest imports um into south wales was roman wine oh, i thought you were gonna say Car- i definitely abs- thought you were gonna say carlin or like lager <laughs> <laughs> oh. like, oh, yeah, they love Carolyn. Yeah. No, it was Roman wine, so they they fucking yeah. loved a jar even back yeah. then in true Welsh fashion. So yeah, lots of uh, lots of respect for that. So we've established that Celts used their crafting skills to create trade items, but these items would also have another purpose, which was to sacrifice to the gods. They were um, pagan. Well, what's described as pagan, but basically these gods were before sort of Christianity and things. These were the gods that they um, had worshipped for generations and generations. And uh, they would sacrifice um, things to the gods for all sorts of things. So it could be as simple as asking for a good crop yield that year, uh, to ask for fortune in an upcoming battle. Um, it could be anything, really. A, a bigger uh, todge. And a bigger todge. You know, you don't want to have to hide it from the boys when you're going to battle. <laughs> and no one will let you wear chainmail for you. Know. But... <laughs> Fame Wales just took the form of um, offering these sometimes absolutely like pristine works of art um, by throwing them into lakes. Another thing Celts found very spiritual was like water, um, and they would sacrifice their these crafts and things like that into lakes. I, I'm not spiritual, art, uh, uh, you know, I'm, mm. quite, I'm not religious, but I do think water is probably the most like ethereal. Um, it does feel the most kind of potent thing you have. So I think I, I, I yeah, get that. So. In Celtic mythology, the um the the original gods sort of come from like the water of life. I think they're called called Danu or something like that, and it just has a very big prevalence through like their their spiritual side of things, you know. And I yeah, you can totally get it. Like you said, it's um it's <laughs> what is this shit, you know? What yeah. I mean? And it's like omnipotent, <laughs> How weird. And, like it's huge and vast and scary and like. And like it, if something went fell to the bottom of the lake back in those days gonzo. there's no Absolutely way going to get that gonzo. it's gone it's it's gone to the other world basically yeah. is what they used to think so um for example there's this one archaeological dig that found a handcrafted metal dog about as tall as a fireplace and it was apparently wow. like inc- incredibly detailed it would have taken the artist that made it at least three years to finish with the kind of sort of tech and tools they had available at then i love that after all that just like oh that's amazing mate <laughs> I'm just going to dump that in the lake and go, like, so oh, funny. Really? Ah, I've lost my wife, my, my home, I don't see my yeah. friend. Oh, I've done it. Right. Fuck the off. The Celtic wife. That's your problem. You just never turn off. And he's you like, but off, it'll all be you? worth it. Yeah. It'll all be worth it when I finish my big old <laughs> pristine dog. Right, it's going I like in the to lake imagine it. Sauce. The, the very final like chisel. Just, ah. Oh, look, shit. Off you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll sacrifice this one. Fuck just it. yeeted it into a fucking lake. 
Yeah, and I wonder, the thing is, it, these were all like, um, it was all relative, so like you might chuck a, a gold bangle in to ask for something relatively minor, but then yeah. with something like that, it make uh, I you know it, it, people speculate what would they what were they after to give something yeah. so you kind just, of valuable? You know that there'd be some little little tea a little tea leaf little thief just watching mm. from whenever they go. Oh, I'm gonna go like pray for the gods. They throw off the little bangle and he's straight in there with his like uh, reeds made <laughs> yeah. into a scuba diving equipment. Yeah. He's there. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, he's just got there's a lily pad moving yeah. across the surface of blowing <laughs> bubbles. <you know>? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, you definitely would if you if you were yeah. a man without conscience back then. I'm saying I would be that man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me and you sat there with a couple of t- well, no, we tins, but anyway. no. things of Roman wine going yeah. to come out Plugging. on any day now. <laughs> so, not only did they uh, sacrifice items, there's lots of talk from the Roman perspective of Celts being like bloodthirsty savages. But this isn't unique to the Celts. The Romans basically described almost everyone that fought against them in this way. You know, it's like kind of a uh, the winner writes the history books type of thing. Yeah. But there is, um, to the Celts' detriment, I guess, there is some evidence to suggest that the Celts did practice animal and even human sacrifice on occasion. So bodies recovered from peat bogs had evidence that they were religious killings. Uh, the bog had preserved one so well that examiners determined that he'd been bludgeoned over the head, garroted, and had his throat slit before being Ooh. chucked in the bog. So this, uh, one of these um, finds, it's not actually in Wales, but it's called the Lindow Man, or Lindo Man, I'm not sure I'm saying it right. Um, and it's, it was likely a sacrifice victim of extraordinary importance. They even managed to identify his stomach contents, which contained barley griddle, something called barley griddle cake. Ancient Celts would tear the cake into pieces and have sacrificed candidates draw the pieces in turn and then whoever had the most burnt piece of the griddle cake would be the one sur- sacrificed. And so experts have suggested that Lindow Man would have been a high-ranking druid and that he was sacrificed to the Celtic gods to stop a Roman offensive that happened in 60 AD. Uh, this was, I think this is up near, uh, I want to say Cheshire. Um I should have wrote that down. But yeah, it's that, that's technically in England, but it's not far from the border of Wales anyway. Um, but I, I thought, fucking barley griddle type of cake. You'd be going, I hope the cook is fucking <laughs> nice and consistent. <laughs> like you'd be going, oh, you got the most burnt bit. Nah, nah, fucking Jim's one's more burnt, isn't it? It's, Come it on. does have to be shit anyway. Non-burnt. Yeah. Barley griddle. Barley griddle cake. Mm. Sounds rubbish. But yeah, so these great craftsmen, uh, they were also pretty violent, which brings me to my next point. Uh, the Celts were a very feisty bunch, and it's just as well they were good at making weapons because they were a collection of warrior tribes, and they bloody loved using them. So they respected physical strength and skill in battle, and similarly, similarly to Vikings, loved to fight and feast in equal measure. When tribes in Wales weren't fighting each other, they worked as mercenaries, either fighting domestically or abroad, and were noted for their fierceness in battle. Old kings would be entombed with their weapons and chariots to mark the great battles in their lives, and sometimes they'd even be sealed up with their horses that were still alive uh, so they could ride them to Anun, or, or the Celtic afterlife. Also worth noting that Celts were an equal opportunity warrior caste, and that they didn't care if you were a man or a woman, only what you could do in a scrap, basically. So the biggest example of this probably being Boudicca, yeah. um, who was another Britonic Celt, uh, from the Akani tribe, which is um, in the east of what modern it's England. It's like south of London. It looks like a bit like London area, I think. Was that now? I th- where she was originally from. I think she had fights on the Thames. Yeah, oh, she fought up in the River Thames, but apparently she's from the Akani tribe, which is East Anglia. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, sorry. Um, I don't know. Sorry, the thing is, when brief. the Romans came. Yeah, I know. Sorry. You're welcome. When the Romans came, a lot of tribes moved around quite a yeah. lot. Yeah. Because where they were usually displaced from where they were originally, and they end up like shacking up or sharing territory with others, so yeah, it's probably moved around quite a bit, yeah. But yeah, um, as I said, they, they didn't care if you were a man or a woman, as long as you could fight, basically, they were pretty impressed with you. Um, I, w- I won't go into anything on Boudicca in this because, um, although it's a really good story, we'll probably do a, 
an episode. Definitely. Isn't it? Even yeah, though we, she's technically not from Wales, but no, she's but, a Celt. So, you know, but same she, sort of she does end up moving to North Wales. By the end of it, she's pushed to North Wales. Yeah, um, and she actually does have an effect on Celtic And Wales she well, has so. a Welsh... She, what she shouts is something Welsh when she goes into war. Mm. She has like her... Well, I, yeah, we'll go into her in a more detailed episode, but yeah, I, it's quite hard to find any lots of things on her that's quite easily digestible. So we, yeah. we, we will do an episode it's, um, on the other show, though. What's difficult, I found with... Uh, you know, this book was great because it sort of set things, but like if you try and do any further reading, even the book says it's... Because the most of the records you have to go off are Romans, Yeah, it's... A bit like yeah, everything's a little bit biased, and yeah. also it's not going to go into details of like, oh my god, how tactically sound were the Celts? You know, it, yeah. it portrays them as savages a lot. Well, so well yeah, we'll out. cover that. Yeah. Uh, also, I was going to say, I know you said the, they arrived at like six hundred BC, didn't they? You said. Mm. There's other people who say they arrived like a thousand B- BC. Yeah, um, that's the thing. I didn't want to. I wanted to just pick one and, and run with it because yeah. I looked at and apparently the. Um, the sort of most agreed on, if you like, even yeah. though it's still hotly debated, is about 600 BC. Yeah. But yeah, some people think they were there as, as far back as a thousand. But but like you said, there was no one there before them, which I think is the important part. There was mm. no one there, no one around here before, so it was. It felt very much like their land. Yeah, that's something that made me sort of um, very interested in them, in that they, they didn't displace or conquer people yeah. before them. You know, they they were fresh into the land. Yeah. So sorry, anyway, back, back to you oh, in where the was studio. I? That's all right. Um, here we go. Where was I? So I was on about yeah. So they, they they respected men and women equally. You know, if you were uh, good with a sword or a spear or an axe or whatever, they they didn't care if you were a man or woman. Um, and they also practiced something called kavran, uh, which is um, an inheritance system where all children would ha- inherit their parents' land, title, and wealth, etc., equally. And this is cool. something interestingly enough that stayed in Wales yeah. until medieval times, and they didn't dissolve that until sort of later in the medieval. Yeah, Wales. we covered that before, haven't we? Where, where yeah, lit- I think is in the last doing. episode actually. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Keeping track of the bloody episode. <laughs> Trying to realise you're king of the pod. <laughs> Today I am. I'm Celtic <laughs> chieftain. Um, anyway, so the point being, uh, they were a nation of boys and girls. They loved nothing better than crafting a fine-looking weapon. And then smashing your face in with it, basically. Yeah, lovely stuff. So just to sum up, because I know there's a few uh, little riffs in there and stuff, uh, to sum up for the listeners, the Celts were the original settlers in the British Isles. They were an offshoot of a greater Celtic nation in mainland Europe. They were amazing metal workers and craftsmen, spiritual to the point of giving sacrifices of gifts, animals, and even people to their gods. And they were fierce and proud warriors. So that's the kind of background of just... To give you a flavour of who we're talking about, how this sort of, um, these sort of people and what, what they were like. And now I'll move on to this next section, which is going to be about the Roman invasion of Britain, or Britannia as they called it, and how that affected Welsh Celts and shaped the country going forward. I would, I'm going to touch a little bit on just the invasion in general of Britain, where they, because they, they landed in um, south of England. Uh, I'll touch a little bit about it, just to give you context, but I would. Uh, advise reading up about it in more depth because it is really interesting but I'm just going to focus on the Welsh Celtic I I do a little bit of it on the next episode there we are so there's a little bit more of a tidbit for you next episode as well I I try and just do the broad strokes I'm trying to focus mainly on uh, on lovely green Wales so to set the stage uh, Celtic Wales was similar to how it was in later historic periods and that it wasn't a united front just like in medieval times where it was split into different kingdoms, Celtic Wales was split into five main tribes. Uh, the northeast was controlled by the Deci Angli, the northwest by the Ordovices, Mid Wales was under control of the Cornovi, the southwest was home to the Demete, and the southeast was home to the Ciliars. We've mentioned the Ciliars before on the pod, but they are basically considered aggressive and ferocious even by Celtic standards. And they'll come up again in a little bit, but uh, yeah, just keep in mind that it's sort of five main tribes. The sub tribes, the, they the don't really get much. Uh, the Cornovi in Mid Wales, so it's it's more like Mid East actually, um, but yeah, they uh, they don't play a huge part if I'm honest. But they were a, a sizable tribe back in the day. Because I I didn't pick them up on mine. I only had four tribes. I got uh, basically I got that off uh, the book I read. It's got like a little map, and it's got the four tribes, and then it's got the corner of I in like a smaller font. So, so there is. If you look at the map, 
it, they're, they're Shropshire, North, Staffordshire and Cheshire, so it looks like he's all in England. Oh, the one I, I um, it might be it, just over the, maybe it's over the border. Eastern parts of the Welsh, so it's predominantly Cheshire, Shropshire, Staffordshire, North Herefordshire, and then uh, eastern parts of Flintshire, Powys and uh, Wrexham. Ah, that'll be why it said online. So it's like a, yeah. what the marshlands kind of would have been. In uh, the marshlands were further down in the south, weren't they? Oh, fuck me then, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I th- yeah, the Marshallites are down. All right. <laughs> on the border then. They were on the bloody border. Cross border Celts, okay? Yeah, this is meant to be my one where I sound like I know what I'm fucking talking about. <laughs> I'm going to re. I-, I tell you what. I'm going to fucking message uh, Miranda Aldhouse Green and Ray Howell, the writers of Celtic Wales, and say that fucking Joey map you gave me has got uh, me in hot water now. Hang on. I take that back. The Marshallands were uh, Shropshire, Herefordshire. Um, well, was, <laughs> well, well. <laughs> <laughs> How the turntables. <laughs> so you were wrong. It wasn't in Wales. I was wrong. The Marshallands weren't South Wales. I'm so, okay, so we'll sorry, call, Dad. We'll call. We'll call it fucking quits. Then shall we? We'll stop yeah, this man. vicious rivalry between us. Yeah. Bury the hatchet and gone with the pod. I'm just going to look at a, look at a map. Trying to look at a map to show where the martial lords were, and it's it's all in fucking fourteenth century, century language. It goes pura valia, mercha valia. So fucking show me where the border is, mate. <laughs> mate, when I was preparing for this, I was going like, because uh, I was trying to find out where the original Celtic uh, nation was. Thing, it's not called Gaul back then, right? But I was like, where's Gaul on uh, against a modern map? And it was like, show me a modern map, and then show me like an ancient map from like the Roman times. Where there's like places called Celtica and stuff like that. I was like, none of this is helpful. Yeah. I can't use this on the pod. Um, well, yeah, hang on. Whoa. Big, big breaking news. The borderland, mm. the Marshalllands do sometimes cross down to like Newport and Cardiff. So, it news just in <laughs> a thousand year old border, we've kind of slightly defined it a bit more. Um, I'll let you decide <sighs> what you cut doing? and keep from this conversation. So Roman aggression first began under Julius Caesar when he destroyed the Veneti, that Celtic tribe from Brittany I mentioned earlier that were like sort of our gateway into the European market. So by taking over the coast and dominating trade to Britain, Caesar set the stage for his first Roman invasion in 55 BC, even recruiting some southern tribes in England as clients through the new trade routes. The first invasion would be foiled by Celtic forces only for Big Bad Julius to return the following year with a much larger force, landing in Kent and carving their way up to the Thames River. Caesar agreed to leave Britain on the condition of the Celts paying a significant tribute and granting them hostages. The big push from the Romans came almost 100 years later in 43 AD under Emperor Claudius, when the final invasion, led by General Aulus Partius, I think I've said that right, landed three armies of Roman legions and auxiliaries at Richborough, Limpney and Dover. Some auxiliaries were even other Celts from Europe because, as I mentioned, Celts were notorious um, mercenaries, so they would have picked some up from, from Europe there. The Roman armies were met with only skirmishes to begin with, a tactic the Celts were hoping would delay them so they could form a larger force to face him on the River Medway. The battle lasted two days, with some evidence suggesting Rome even brought some elephants to the battle for shock and awe tactics. I don't know if that's true, but how fucking mental would that be as yeah. like a British Celt yeah, um, fucking seeing a fucking elephant on the battlefield? <laughs> fucking but, uh, elephant. Yeah, prob- elephant. Oh, f- <laughs> like, have you seen this photo? It's a fucking big cow, isn't it? It's, fucking um, <laughs> it's a fucking elephant. Why are we doing fucking Jordan? <laughs> hey, a fucking elephant, man. It's not a fucking <laughs> elephant. <laughs> in my eyes, the Celts back then all had the accents with of modern yeah. geography, you know, so. <laughs> fucking yeah, elephant. Yeah. Massive elephant coming down here now. <laughs> oh, don't be daft. Oh, I don't, don't know oh it's the biggest thing that. I've ever seen. Fucking massive. Here we get it. So that is probably a little bit of poetic license, but I like the idea that they brought these fucking huge beasts. You know, reminds me of that, that scene from elephant. 300 where it's like, he bought his beast from Persia, forest Persia. But anyway, so t- after two days of like fighting. The fucking cat. <laughs> we bring hounds from like my stick. Yeah, fucking hell, yeah, like, what are these 
feral beasts. <laughs> It's a fucking staffy bulldog. But um, after two days, the, the Romans only managed to win when the Celtic auxiliaries showed up, shooting down the horses, leading the Celtic chariots. So auxiliaries that's are confusing, like light-armoured soldiers. Yeah, like they're Jack not Spears. Roman centurions. Yeah, yeah they're not yeah. highly armoured. They're not highly trained. They're I just like you your, your backup, your militia. Yeah. I think you said the Celtic... Yeah, so the Romans, I, know, I was just about to say, clarify, because I know it's confusing, even the way I've spelled it. Oh. So the Ro- the Romans had um, Celtic auxiliaries that were mercenaries yeah. from European Celtic territories. Ooh. And they came over to fight the Britonic Celts. And in this is- situation, the Indo-European Celt auxil- auxiliaries showed yeah. up and they shot down the horses that were pulling the Britonic Celtic chariots. If I hope that's clear because that fried my brain just trying to say that. So, when that happened, the skilled and well armed legionnaires then pushed the main Tell Celtic me. force, eventually causing them to scatter. So, from there, the disciplined Roman military would either beat back Celtic resistance or force tribes to sue for peace. But eventually, they had a solid hold over southern England, uh, but this was not the case in Wales. So, respected warriors and leaders that fought at the River Medway battle including uh, a little boy named Caradog, or Caraticus, as the Romans called him. He moved west after the collapse of the resistance in England and made it a centre of Roman resistance, turning the eyes of the Roman army toward Wales. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to touch too much on Caraticus, yes, or Caradog, our boy Caradog, because yeah. that's frankly the name. In 47 AD, then, the, the Roman named Publius Ostorius was granted governorship of Britannia, and one of the first things he had to deal with was a rebellion by the Akani tribe, the same one that Boudicca would, would hail from then in East Anglia. Uh, the rebellion was swiftly dealt with, and with his confidence high, he set out to quell the growing talks of resistance in Wales. Ostorius sent a force deep into the territory of the Deci Angli, the tribe located in the northeast of Wales, ravaging and pillaging the lands as he went. This also uh, tactically drove a wedge between the fierce Welsh Ciliers and Ordovices and the equally renowned Brigantes. They were a Celtic tribe in North England. So their forces drive, drove a wedge between Wales and the Brigantes, preventing them from uniting against the Romans and creating like a bigger army. What, what, in a wedge, in the sense of a physical wedge, they couldn't get to each other, or they were... No, 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 like the, the, their large army went up purposely into northeast Wales and yeah. cut them off from the Ingla, English yeah. border. Or what is now the English border, so that they could, the Welsh tribes and the English tribe, the Brigantes, couldn't merge together because they were both yeah. renowned. So when you said drove a wedge, I thought you were like they were slightly going. Oh, do you hear what they said about you? They called you as a pair of oh, boots. Mate, yeah, he's literally slagged your missus <laughs> off. Like, what? You want to fight yeah. with him? Yeah, I actually the Brigantes called you. They, they think you're a bit mm. like this. Ooh, I'll never tell. Yeah, and if you and if you fight with him now, that just makes you weak. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, they um, uh, this move actually prompted the Brigantes to attack uh, from the north, north, northeastish, which drew the Roman forces north and uh, away from Wales, giving the Deci Angli a brief reprieve. Once the skirmishes with the Brigantes were finished, Ostorius turned his attention back to Wales, convinced the heart of Roman resistance now lie with them, particularly with the tribe of the Ciliars, whose anti-Roman feelings quote could be changed by neither sternness nor leniency. On top of the Cilia's natural disdain for the Romans, they had been emboldened by Caradog, aka Caraticus, who had been embraced by them shortly after the battle at the River Medway. Caradog was a chieftain uh, of the Catavalani tribe that hailed from southeast England, one that had faced the Romans early in their invasion and had lost many men and women to the legions, including Caradog's own brother. Caradog, a die-hard anti-Roman, fell at home with the warlike Ciliers and rose to the top of their ranks as their war leader. As I said before, I won't talk too much about him because we're going to do an episode on him. Ostorius pushed his army into Silurian territory, building fortresses and strongholds as he went. Because of their presence in their homeland, Caradog began to move his forces towards the land of the Ordovices, some speculate in an attempt to create an alliance between the two tribes. Determined to thwart such an alliance, the Romans pursued Caradog and his Celts into mid-Wales, where a decisive battle followed. Like I said, I won't go into the battle, but let's just say it was a goodie. Uh, we'll cover the details in the Caradog episode, um, so make sure you listen. A little sizzle reel for you there. But let's just say uh, the battle went the way it went, <laughs> and 
then the Silurian rebellion raged on uh, and if, if anything they became even more aggressive in the tactics so one of the biggest reasons for this was Astorius's own method of dealing with the Silurians which was by either extermination or what was called transplantation to Gaul so Gaul was the at this point uh, one of the larger Celtic nations in mainland Europe it covered sort of kind of where uh, modern day France is and a bit bigger than that actually but just to give you an idea of where it was the Romans continued to build forts in the land of their enemy but to heavy Silurian resistance one instant ending with a force of ciliars cutting off and destroying eight centurion forces plus their auxiliaries so that's 800 men plus some change basically which is quite impressive <laughs> plus, a um, plus a tip plus a tip to quote the book I read, um, continuing warfare became order of the day. So it was a very difficult thing to be a Roman in southeast Wales at that time. In classic Welsh fashion, the Ciliars used effective guerrilla tactics, using the land to their advantage in the native woods and bogs. And also to give you uh, some imagery, the woods back then would have been like fucking rainforests because they'd been so dense. Um, so if you didn't know your way around them and you were fighting an enemy that did, uh, you were in trouble basically. So it's always been tradition in Wales, apparently, to just fight in a sort of hit-and-run tactic, yeah. even back to the Celt times. Another skirmish saw the Ciliars destroy a cohort of auxiliaries carrying valuables, which they distributed amongst themselves. Ostorius died shortly after this, and the Roman historian Tacitus attributes his death to having his spirit crushed by the numerous defeats at the hands of the Celts, saying, So great a general, even if not defeated in battle, had at least been eliminated by warfare. So he was just he couldn't couldn't deal with the losses, the big L's all the time. And then upon Astorius' death, the Silurian War would be in a state of limbo for many years. Some years favouring the rebellion and others leading to Roman advances. I'd recommend reading about it because it is interesting, but basically a load of governors arrive, then leave for various reasons, trying to cut some time down, but it is interesting, just you know, if you want to look into it, do do your own bloody research. The next big change would be in seventy four or seventy five AD when a guy named Sextus Julius Fontanus, were Sextus, <laughs> became governor and managed to all but subdue the Ciliars. Annoyingly, though, there isn't much to go on in terms of how he did it, but the quote from Tacitus, the historian, says, After a hard struggle, he conquered the powerful warlike nation of the Ciliars, overcoming both the valour of his enemies and the difficulty of the terrain. I do like that the fact they constantly use the terrain to their advantage meant that they had to mention it in the yeah. record sort of thing yeah. it's pretty good so by this time the romans were secure enough in southeast wales to build legionary fortresses including one in carleon one in lower usk and one in chester with three large armies housed on their territory the Silvias were vastly outnumbered and the re rebellion was difficult to maintain or even be effective to strengthen their stranglehold of wales further Front frontinus's successor agricola would lead an army north and eradicate several tribes of the ordovices after they'd slaughtered a Roman cavalry unit. This was the end of the large-scale military action in Wales, having basically pacified the resistance there. The struggle to get through was remarkable, with the Silias being the most difficult tribe in the Western Empire to subdue. By 78 AD, no fewer than 30,000 Romans were stationed in Wales, just to keep the peace. From there on, the Romans continued to build new structures and strengthen their existing ones, originally to secure their military hold, but eventually these would turn toward to towns and trading hubs, introducing a money economy based on coins instead of trade, and mixing the cultures of the Romans with that of the natives. While the southeast of Wales saw heavy Romanization, the southwest and some northern territories saw far less and even opposing practices and traditions, choosing to keep their Celtic gods and languages alive. The Romans would eventually leave Britain in 383 AD, leaving Britain open to invasion once again by Jutes, Saxons and the Angles but ironically left Wales in a much better position to defend itself from these new invaders thanks to all the strongholds and forts they built. Uh, it does kind of suck that because the Ciliars fought hardest, they're the ones who basically got wiped out, uh, where the other tribes like the Demetae in the southwest and some of the northern ones got to, to sort of hey, carry on. That's, you know, that's evolution, Celts. mate. That's, that's nature. But that's just it, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I know it's repetitive at this point, how much we say it, but I do wish sometimes that all of Wales would just unite, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it wasn't so... Yeah. disparate 
could maybe fight off his bloody invasion. But but we we but romanticize yeah, it, don't we? We romanticize it. Yeah, it's true. I bet the city is if you lived next to them, you're like they're fucking so annoying. It's like when you yeah. got a neighbour, it's like fucking off their head on like coke and yeah. <laughs> boozed up all night, and you go, "Sorry guys, yeah. can you keep it down?" Like, fucking you, fucking all kind of fucking down. Got a, like a, a solarian on neighbours from hell, nightmare tenants <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Fucking yeah. kicking your bins over every night and stuff. <laughs> But yeah, that's the uh, that's the not so short version anyway, and I thought I'd condense it where I could. But that's yeah, no, it's not that short. But that's what, that's what I got. That's what I gave you. It's hard to condense too much because so much is relevant. You know, it's like uh, all and these things have such yeah. knock on effects. I know we're trying to keep it pithy for people, but it is you know the whole point of this is to try and share and like you know, shed the light on an otherwise dim littered history. Is what we used to say, isn't it? So I think you exactly. did a brilliant job there. That was good. Cheers, mate. Well, I, um, I certainly found it very interesting when I was reading my little book, The Written well, Word. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. These new books are helping us, aren't they? <laughs> We've got our books. I know it sounds, it sounds so, so like, um, I don't know, like we're not thick. We know that books existed <laughs> before this, but it, we always thought it'd be easier to just do like a bit of research online and like sort of piece things but, together ourselves. But the books are so much better at like framing context yeah. and, uh, and if and you do it online you, you end up having like six different people telling you different things and it's like oh at least you mean mm. the book you just have one set of narrative and what one person's like uh, like research based stuff on it so yeah i mean the, yeah. when you were mentioning stuff then i'm gonna cover it on the next episode um and like the i i i know i think the flow of the books if if we were doing this from not doing the books that like you were just doing online and i was doing online i bet mm. you the cohesiveness of it wouldn't be there so Again, oh, so many inconsistencies. Yeah. yeah, it's um. I think as well that yeah, like you said, there's stuff I've probably mentioned in this right that I'm sure someone could find records or examples mm. of where what I've said is not the right thing. But yeah, like, I've just read it from one book, and that's obviously yeah. that research. So sewers. So, so, yeah. so fucking. So suck my your dick. issue is with your fucking <laughs> author, not. Us. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. It's like we're we're not just basing it off fucking. Yeah, hearsay or whatever. We're basing it off someone else who's done the research. Hmm. <laughs> but do you want to quote the book? Do you want to give the, uh, the people the book? Yeah, I think you did mention Yeah, so I but... mentioned them earlier when I was going to fucking write them a note for yeah, sailing down the fucking river with that map. But, <laughs> yeah. but no, it is good, but it's yeah. called uh, Celtic Whales and it's by Miranda Aldhouse Green and Ray Howell. Pick it up at any of your local Waterstones, like I did. Yeah. Uh, and it was pretty fucking cheap as well. It was only like four quid. Um, and it, I had a fucking great time. I was reading this bad boy in the roasting antigua sun with a little fucking cocktail in my hand and it was it was great a little so fucking cock in my this, hand i was a cow little co- my yeah, cocktail in one hand tiny little cock in my other hand <laughs> um and just like my celtic ancestors <laughs> and yeah if you um if you're interested in this stuff highly recommended all right well should we well we don't need to read out any reviews we did that at the start it's quite a long happy anyway so let's say deal from that Thank you for listening. Uh, keep sending in the reviews and the likes and sharing with your mates and all that stuff. Um, and yeah, we love you, you idiots. Yeah, yeah. Follow us on the all the socials and shit. Yes. We'll link it in the the description. Very true. And all that shit. So yeah, thank you very much, right. Chris. Dear catch you soon. Ta-da. Yeah, I'll spell it like For the empire, copper, gold, and silver were things that they deserved. Beasts and gladiators were Roman pleasures. Theaters and hypocaust were Roman treasures. The Romans were victorious. Their reign was glorious. They changed the Celtic way of life. With roads and baths and settlements and Roman decadence, they ruled this land for 400 years. Somebody tried to fight them Her name was Boudicca She was a queen, a warrior Of the Iceni tribe Her army marched to Colchester And burned the temples down They marched on to London Then on to Spain to bend. The Romans were more organized And to the Celts' surprise The Romans got the upper hand And crushed the rebellion and Rather than be prisoner The Iceni queen Boudicca Planned her own demise She drank poison and died The Romans were victorious Their reign was glorious They changed the Celtic way of life With roads and baths and settlements And Roman decadence They ruled this land for 400 years